Hello there, fight friends, and welcome to the MMA show, the show about Canadian mixed martial arts and only Canadian mixed martial arts. This week, we'll be joined by special guest Faber Glass from the MMA Talk to discuss Battlefield Fight League 79 that took place in Vancouver last weekend. Next up, we'll have interviews with Adam Posner and Radley Da Silva to talk about their victories at that event. Next up will be Chief Operating Officer of Palace Athena Women's Fighting Championship, Jenica Wheeler. And finally, we'll have an interview with Dr. Faisal Remen, a nephrologist from London, Ontario, to talk about uh, fighters missing weight and going to the hospital in Canada in the past couple of weeks. Like usual, we'll start off with fighter and event announcements for the past seven days. If you want to follow along with me, pause here and head over to MMA.ca and go to the upcoming fight section. You ready? Okay, let's go. Fighter announcements. We'll start off with two Canadians who will be fighting at Bellator 302 in Belfast, Ireland on March 22nd. Bellator's number four ranked middleweight, Aaron Jeffrey, will be taking on number one ranked Englishman, Fabian Edwards. Jeffrey last fought at Bellator 298, where he gave formerly undefeated prospect Dalton Rosten his first ever loss. If the situation were to have occurred a year ago, it would have been safe to assume that Aaron, that if Aaron won, he would replace Edwards in the number one contender spot and would be next up to fight Bellator middleweight champ Johnny Eblen for the title. But it's not so simple. As you know, the Professional Fighters League, or PFL, has recently purchased Bellator MMA, and the two organizations will be having a PFL champion versus Bellator champion event on February 24th in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. In that event, PFL light heavyweight champ Impa Kasangane will be dropping down a weight class to fight uh, Eblen at 185. And this is where it gets interesting. Jeffrey and Kasangane are tight, like really tight. Like they call each other brother tight, like not bro kind of brother, but like brother brother kind of tight. Jeffrey and Kasangane train together at Kill Cliff MMA in Florida, where Jeffrey spends about half of his year when he's not training at Niagara Top Team. If Impa beats Johnny, then we may have to see an Impa versus Aaron fight sometime in the future, which might pose a quandary for the friends. But that's not an inevitability. Don't forget that up until now, the PFL hasn't had a matchmaking approach like other MMA organizations. The PFL has a seasonal approach where fighters work their way up a bracket and make it into playoffs, where finally they end up with two fighters who fight for that year's title in that weight class. I'm not sure how PFL will look after the Bellator merger, acquisition, whatever you want to call it, uh, but once the Champion Series is complete, are they going to retain the seasonal format, or after acquiring all the Bellator fighters, are they going to be such a large size that they'll have to move over to like a more traditional uh, matchmaking type of format? If you know the answer to this, please leave a comment below and tell us what you think or and what you know. Either way, a Jaffrey and Kasangane fight might happen at some point, and if it does, those friends will have to make a decision. The second Canadian will be fighting on the Bellator Belfast card will be British Columbia's Jeremy Kennedy, who will be taking on Ireland's James Gallagher. JBC, as he's known, has had a tumultuous year. His last fight was almost exactly a year ago with a unanimous decision win over Pedro Cavallo. But after that, he was on the waiting list to fight Bellator featherweight champion Patricio Pitbull Freire. But that fight never occurred as Freire lost two subsequent fights. Candy was then scheduled for an interim featherweight title last December, but that entire card was cancelled, and so Kennedy's been waiting, and here we are now. Uh, here I'll share a quote from an article on MMA Junkie about the Kennedy situation. Quote, The PFL Bellator merger has brought a lot of uncertainty to Kennedy. He's not happy with the way things have been going and the lack of clarity. Kennedy is hoping to get an answer soon. If he doesn't get a title shot, he wants a big name in the meantime. What's certain is that he doesn't have much interest in the tournament model and wants to be a part of matchmaking bouts, end quote. So that sounds like it might be a concern for Kennedy and other fighters. Do they like the champion, or sorry, the, the seasonal format? I'm not so sure. Do you know if any other fighters like it or don't like it? Leave a comment below. Earlier you heard me refer to Kennedy by his nickname of JBC. If you know what that stands for, let us know what you think in the comments below. And hint, you may or may not be able to find that somewhere on MMA.ca. Bonus points if you know the story and how he got that nickname. Now, moving on from Bellator to the UFC, Muskoka, Ontario's Kyle the Monster Nelson will be looking to make it three UFC wins in a row when he takes on Bill Algio at the UFC Fight Night scheduled for Atlantic City, New Jersey, on March 30th. This will be the first fight on Nelson's new four-fight contract that he was rewarded after his recent wins over two really good opponents. 
Finally, we have the Suplex Kid, great name, James Clark, who will be taking on American Colt Kielbasa for the flyweight title of a new organization called M2 MMA in Sinbi Stadium in Phuket, Thailand on March 31st. That's it for fighters. Now let's move on to event announcements. Breaking news yesterday as Battlefield Fight League owner Jay Golshani told MMA.ca that BFL 80 will be taking place on May 9th. And presumably in Vancouver, I didn't ask, but I think it's safe to assume. Burlington Training Center, BTC Fight, has told MMA that the heavyweight tournament that we announced that starting at BTC, BTC 23 in Kingston on March 16th is being pushed back to start in their June card, date to be announced. MMA previously brought you the news that new amateur Pangration promotion, Norfolk Fighting Championship, will be having their first event in Simcoe, Ontario this summer, and they have just shared with MMA that the date for this will indeed be August 24th. The next Scorpion Combat will take place on April 13th with Scorpion Combat 16. I attended Scorpion 15 on Saturday night and we'll be talking about that one later. Okay, that's it for announcements. In this next segment, we'll be talking about the three MMA events that took place in Canada the past week. Our friend Faber Glass from the MMA Talk attended BFL 79 Vancouver and I'd like to welcome him as our special guest to talk about the event. Welcome Faber to the MMA show. Can't believe I finally made it onto the <laughs> MMA show, man. I can retire right now, man. My life is is complete. Everything that I could accomplish has been accomplished. Uh, what an honor to be here. Thank you so much, Andy, for having me, man. It's always a pleasure to, to talk to you, my friend. What a character. Thank you, Faber. That's really kind of you to say. Yeah, if you want, you can be on episodes number three, four, five, six, and seven, and whatever. We'll see. But anyway. So you like whenever, man, you, you know me, you tell me the place and time and I'll do the best that I can. I know it, yeah. it was tough to, to get each other in BC. I don't know why my, my cell phone reception was, uh, was bugging on me, but finally I'm back home and we're ready to talk about these fights. Man. That's awesome. Cause you've, you've got a passion from the sport that is almost unrivaled. You love everything about it, especially uh, MMA in Quebec, but uh, you love it all. So I'm really glad that you're here. So you just said you were in British Columbia. So that was, imagine my surprise when during the event, uh, Battlefield Fight League, I sent you a message. I said, hey, are you watching watching BFL? And you sent me back a picture from backstage. It was of somebody, a fighter getting their, their hands wrapped or something. So what were you doing in BC? And, and what was what was uh, your experience like at BFL? Yeah, it, what was I doing in BC? I was just living life, man. You know, uh, when Maxim Soucy told me that he was going to fight on February 8th, uh, I looked at the plane tickets. They were very uh, inexpensive because I don't think it's the high season. Like uh, February mm. in BC, it rains all the time. So I don't think it's the <laughs> high tourist season or whatever. So I just bought plane tickets because uh, I got some family in in Vancouver. So I can pretty much go whenever I want. Uh, so I, I used the occasion to, to, to have a little trip for myself. And for BFL, it, it's a great show, man. It's, it's very a great show. I was there uh, for the second time. Mm-hmm. I've been to, was it 77? Uh, w- the one last year when uh, Maxim Soucy beat uh, Nikola Wedev and mm. got the, the interim title, which was a stacked show also, lots of title fights. Honestly, if I had to compare my experience, of course I preferred this time, like the, the event was insane. The venue is, is great, the way that it's built. I like the, 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 the two floors and the concept of the fighters that go down the stairs before their walkout. Uh, it's cool. You got some. If you got access access to upstairs, which I have, uh, thanks to Jay and the old BFL team, mm. uh, you get some great viewpoints of the of the uh, the action from there, and you don't have to be like in the crowd and trying to, to sneak your way into a place where you where you can see well. And no, like generally, you can see that BFL like they got seventy nine events in the book. It, yeah. it shows they know what they're doing. It's a very smooth running show. And it's just, I, I love all the guys back there. I met Jay plenty times. He, he's, he's, a, he's a good guy. I, I'd even say a friend of mine, we went out for dinner a couple of times here and there. Of course, uh, David Showtime Perron is one of my guys, a fellow Quebecois, and the guy who introduced me to the gym where I train when I'm in BC. So I, I go there, get to see some people that I like and I don't get to see often and enjoy some uh, some amazing fights, man. So was just great all around. Wish I was still there. That's the only issue, but that's for another day. 
that's one of my favorite parts about attending MMA events in Canada is that as you go around from place to place, show to show, you run into people. You run into people that you've known for a long time. You've run into people that you're close with. You've run into people that you may have chatted with on the internet but never met in person. It's just, I, I love it the whole time. So no, one of us... Absolutely, man. Yeah, one thing I noticed right off the bat, I've never attended a BFL live, but uh, right off the bat on the pay-per-view, or sorry, on UFC Fight Pass, I noticed when the event started, it seemed like it was empty, like there was nobody in the seats. And I realized... The show starts at 4.30 p.m. on a Thursday. And do you have any sort of awareness on why that happens, why it starts so early and why on a Thursday? Like the, like the event filled up over time? Because I think people were still at work when it started. Yeah, no, mostly people were, were at work or like slowly getting towards the venue. Uh, for the time, honestly, probably it was due to the number of fights on the event. Mm-hmm. Like they were like they had to do some post limbs basically to, to 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 fit everything in, so that I think that's why they started that early. I don't think last time it it was that early, uh. But uh, yeah, I I think that's probably because of the the number of fights there was on the event that it started that that yeah. early. Because yeah, and and for the day of the week, that's the question I have too, honestly. Because BFL they they did some shows on Wednesdays on Thursdays, like usually it's. Friday or Saturday is the day that makes yeah. the most sense. And so I, I don't know why they, they keep doing events during the week. But like you said, the, the, the place filled up and there was a good crowd uh, at the end. Yeah. So I guess it, oh, it's, it, it's still yeah. a successful event for them. So if you can do it on a Thursday like that, probably not the busiest day on UFC Fight Pass. Like you don't have super uh, mm-hmm. big competition or whatever. So maybe that, that boosts the, the ratings or whatever. I don't know. But. Yeah, that, that that's a good question to, to maybe ask Jay or someone from BFL. Yeah. Like why, yeah. why they're doing events during the week. Well, I didn't mind it, actually. Um, and I like the fact that it was over. Um, er, you know, I'm in Ontario right now, which is three hours later than BC. And even though, uh, you know, I think it was over pretty early-ish for me. I wasn't up all, all night watching the event, so that was good. Okay, let's move on to uh, now the, the actual event. Unless, sorry, did I cut you off? Were you going to say something? You no. look like you're going to say something. Okay. Uh, All right, I'm let's always, move on to the I'm actual always, event. I always got something to say, but sometimes it's better to not say things. Because I could talk for I could talk for 5 hours here, man, but uh... <laughs> Okay, let's go on now. Let's talk about the actual event. We'll start off with the undercard. Uh no, so before we even get to there, so I know that you were flittering around you were going from place to place did you get to watch a lot of the fights or were you busy backstage doing certain things or how'd that work yeah honestly man uh, outside of samurai when i go to events i rarely watch the fights <laughs> to be honest is there because first i often want to shoot a vlog and i've i've come to, to see that what people like to see the most is the backstage stuff it's yeah, like oh yeah. like let's say there, there, there's a one time i come into a room and there's the, the, to one of the locker rooms and there's a TV and like watching the fights all together is like Jamie Siraj, Achilles, Tristan Connolly, Dayan, uh, Rafael Luelet, like a, a full lineup of like BC legends basically. And they're all there just chit chatting and watching the fight. So yeah. that's the footage that the people love to see. So that kind mm-hmm. of prevents me pre- from paying good attention to the fights. There were some fights that I absolutely wanted to sit down and watch. And honestly, I didn't get to sit down and watch all the fights that I wanted to, but uh, I got to watch the the Max Susi main event, of course. And yeah. uh, Adam Posner was was one of the ones that I sat down mm-hmm. to watch. That's why I'm kind of a little sad that I missed him, uh, but I can't wait to see what he had to say. I'll rewatch the episode yeah. uh, for that for sure. Awesome. Well, why don't we talk about the Maxime Susi fight then, since that's the one you saw. You, you've uh, got a close affiliation with Maxime Susi, being a fellow Quebecois, and you basically went out there uh, to support him, and partially anyway. So he was fighting Radley De Silva for the BFL featherweight champion. At the time, Maxime had the interim uh, belt, and Radley was the challenger, and Radley ended up winning. Um, tell me what your thoughts were on that fight. Yeah, no, of course, Maxime is a close friend of mine. That I always like to say this before I... I go on with my thoughts because sometimes, like you, mm-hmm. you don't want to be biased, but you kind of are either way. And yeah, like I, I, I love the guy; he's a he's a close friend of mine. So, of course, I didn't enjoy the fight at all. But honestly, <laughs> I don't think I'm the only one, to be honest. 
And you got to give all the props to Radley. Like, the guy knew what he had to do. Maxim Soucy is a dangerous striker. Radley's a very good striker, too. But, like, why take the risk to do that when you think yep. that you're physically stronger mm -hmm. than the other guy? So, he, he looked for one takedown around, and then he was on top. And he stayed, like, head low, hips low, everything super low. Two, the detriment of actual damage or submission attempts. or Like, honestly... Maxim Soucy wouldn't have to do much to win these rounds, even though he got controlled that much on the ground, because, like, in the end, Radley was controlling a lot, but was not scoring with much. Like, I can remember once or twice, Len did a good elbow or d did mm -hmm. some things, but, like, did not look to pass the guard that much, was really controlling. And, like, if you're able to control like that for 25 minutes, you're going to win the fight. But let's say the fifth round where he struggled a little more on the takedown and Maxim was landing some uh, Travis Brown elbows and stuff. I was like, just that makes it a closer round than it should be for Radley just mm -hmm. because he's not having much offense. But uh, now clearly uh, he was physically stronger than Max and he, he, he's become a very good grappler too. Like for a guy who's known for his capoeira and everything, the guy has become a very good grappler and I think it's primarily what he does right now. And uh, forced to admit that it's a good game plan and he absolutely dominated that fight and he deserves to be the champion. He's still early mm -hmm. in his career though, so it's something you like to see uh, from somebody who's still young in his career and who hasn't, like, he, he fought against McAloon, but before that he hadn't fought in a very long while. Yep. So I think he's still kind of getting his feet back wet, so I expect big things from Radley. I think he's a very good fighter and, like, he could give us, like, exciting finishes and everything. But uh, for that fight, he, he took the very strategic path and he just won the belt. And like at the end of the day, that that's kind of all that matters. Yeah, that's the struggle that people have when we talk about fights like this. F I mean, fans always want the exciting fights, but the exciting fight and the stand-up striking war that people like seeing, or even like a, like a high-paced grappling match, that's not always necessarily the smartest thing for the fighter because you want to win the fight. So if you have a way that you can dominate or you can put yourself in a in a winning position without taking any damage or without it really being dangerous as dangerous maybe that's a smart thing to do and that's what Radley did he repeated it over and over and over he would close the distance he would clinch take Maxime to the cage and then he would either uh press him there or he would scoop him up and take him to the mat and there was one big huge slam I remember that was thrilling to watch yeah, and you know song, I believe yeah, I think so. It was it was early, and that's what he did. And he, he controlled the fight. He controlled Maxim, and now he's the champion. I hope, um, you know, you, you don't want to see every fight like that. Like uh, there have been fighters that have been cut from the UFC because Dana White didn't like that. All they did is they pressured up against the cage, and that's all they did. Uh, so you know that's a strategy, but that's that's still later on in his career, maybe to sort of figure out with his coaches. Um, I know he can do the striking. Like even right off the bat, he did that spinning capoeira kick where it just his leg whipped around so fast and capoeira is really amazing when it's done well and uh radley's team at axe capoeira with his uh his family have been doing it for years and they're probably well without a doubt the best in canada so yeah i don't know i guess we'll have to see what's gonna happen with the next one not for sure and uh like it, it would be hip hypocritical to go here and say that oh, this fight sucked ass, whatever, whatever. When we were there cheering for five rounds of GSP doing that almost every fight. Like. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I didn't want to say any names, but yeah, anyway, uh, I, I a, like I texted the, with the uh, easiest name. Yeah, sorry, man. It's the easiest no, you name go to ahead. Say. Yeah, no, GSP is the yes, easiest name to say in that situation because like. They, he gave us some amazing fights, but like some of the GSP fights were very lackluster. And I feel like people tend to forget that with like the legacy and everything. So I'll just hope for Radley that we'll forget that fight in the end. And like the, the, the guy's probably primed for a good career if he wants to be serious in MMA and really uh, keep uh, being active. So uh, mm -hmm. props to him, man. He's the champ and he deserves it. Absolutely. One thing to point out for the for the people watching who who may not train, have never grappled or wrestled before, is that some of them might look at what Radley did and take Maxime to the cage and hold him up against there, and they think, "Oh, that's easy, man. I could do that." You pro you probably couldn't do that. It's it's not easy. It's not like you're holding a sack of potatoes up against the cage. You're sat you're holding up uh, a living, breathing being who is skilled in their trade and knows how to respond to you. 
So to hold them there, or even when you're in top position on top of the mat, holding someone down is not always the easiest. It's one thing if you weigh 400 pounds, but if you're of equal weight and the other person's strong and they know jujitsu, it's not easy to hold them down. So don't think that this was an easy thing for Radley to do. It was, it was probably the smart thing for him to do. No, it, it's so tough, man, because there's like a different cardio for everything. Mm -hmm. And these guys, they need to be able to do all of that easily. And that that's just makes it so tough. Like, I, I do jiu-jitsu. I can do 85 rounds of jiu-jitsu if I want. And that, that's what I do. But, but when my my coach's son is preparing for mma fight and i gotta put the gloves on and just grapple do nothing else just get on top of him and grapple with him and try to hit him in the face after five minutes i want to die i i'm absolutely gassed out so the, the the fact that these guys they're of course they, they train at it so they get good at it but to think that doing this is easy that oh, he's just laying on the guy it's easy there's so many variables so many different things that he got to be aware of because Maxim Susi is a high level grappler. I think he's a, a purple belt. Like I won't assume his rank, but like I believe a purple belt or like the equivalent of a purple belt in jujitsu. Mm -hmm. So like the guy's an advanced jujitsu player. So if you, you, you're not on your P's and Q's on top of him, like he's going to sweep you. He's going to get back up. You're not going to be able to keep your position. So it, it's tough to do that. Like people don't and the cage grappling is even worse. That's the mm -hmm. that's the most grueling thing probably of all the phases of MMA is the cage grappling. Even though it's not mm -hmm. the the best part to to look at, it's uh, it's absolutely the the toughest and the most grueling part of it all. For sure, there's con when you're up against the cage, there are consequences to every move. If your opponent knows what they're doing, if you move the wrong way or if you put your hips in the wrong direction and your foot in the wrong spot, you're you're either winning a position or you're losing a position. So you have to be very careful. Yeah, it what didn't did even get earth with the cage? Yeah, do you ever see? Uh, I just do... go ahead. I just saw an event uh, I attended on Saturday night, and the, you know people's backs get jacked up against the cage, or, you know the rash against it. So it goes away after time, and it looks really nasty when it happens. Yeah, no, it's bad for toes. It's bad for like you, sometimes you step like on the edge of the mat, and it kind of curves with with mm -hmm. the cage a little bit, and. There's there's kind of a little gap where you can get you can stick a toe in there and and hurt yourself pretty bad and like it's not injuries that affect fights but it happens all the time fighters get get, get their get like foot injury because of of the cage basically. What were you thinking when Maxime had that uh, guillotine choke or guillotine choke on Radley? I think it was tight. Uh, I think it was very tight, and. Uh, I, I know that Maxim and his team, like, they think there was, like, a phantom tap at some point, and they even sent me footage. And, yeah, Radley probably does what resembles a tap, but he only does it once, and everybody knows that, like, that's not, like, when somebody taps out, he taps out. It's not just, like, yeah, one. Yeah. he was probably just trying to grab something, and Max moved, so he kind of tapped on him, so... But yeah, the, the choke was tight for sure. The, the choke was tight for sure. And you could see it from Radley's reaction. Uh, the, the the way that like he stayed calm in it. But there was a point that he, he had to be a little urgent. Because probably he was starting to, 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 to breathe in, in not a good way. And we're, maybe was even seeing a little bit of stars and everything. From where I was watching on, on Fight Pass, Radley's neck was extended a lot. It was really stretched out, and I thought it was possible it was going to be uh, it was going to be over for him. But you got to give him credit, man. Like he he fought through it and he put his body into a different position and and took off that pressure. Yeah, Max did really well when Radley tried to, let's say, bend in, bend in half so that his his old back is almost like vertical. Yeah, and Max was able to to keep his grip super high so the head didn't slip out. So they both adjusted a couple of times within that sequence, and Radley uh, at the final adjustment that that was able to, to to get him out of the choke. So yeah, that that was some nice stuff from both. Okay, well, I spoke with or I texted uh, BFL owner Jay Golshani yesterday, and he confirmed to me that the next BFL number eighty will be on May 9th. Uh, we don't have any confirmed matchups yet, or who will be fighting. Although last night on uh, Instagram, the BFL official account put a whole bunch of uh, stories on there with different potential fighters and different storylines to start considering. So I'll delve into that today and, and take a look and see what I think is going to be on the 80 card. And when I asked Radley about it, he said uh, 
that he doesn't even want to wait that long. That's only a few months away. Uh, he said he wants to get back in the cage and start fighting like as soon as he can. So I guess we'll see what opportunities come his way. Yeah, of course. And with uh, like uh, some of the promotions working together, uh, and, uh, passing fighters uh, around, we might see him in, let's say, in Eastern Canada or in Quebec or in Ontario for BPC or whatever. We, mm -hmm. we just never know nowadays. I mentioned that in last week's show how I'm really enjoying how there seems to be a, a unity between Canadian MMA promotions, specifically BFL, Samurai, and Unified. They're sharing fighters, well, I saw, and uh, Fight League Atlantic as well. They're letting their fighters go elsewhere to fight, even if they're under contract. And, you know, years and years ago, when I first started covering the sport, that never would have happened. So I'm, I'm really enjoying it. I know, me too. I come from the TKO days where when uh, Stefan Patry would block guys from going to the contenders because it's not the UFC. So uh, we've come a long way for sure, man. Yeah. Do you, uh, now, I, since you said you're close to Maxime, can you share your thoughts? Uh, he, he put a post on something, some social media platform. I don't remember which one. It just showed that he, he acknowledges the loss. He seemed like he was in a good attitude, in, in good spirits, and he's got a great attitude. He knows he lost the fight, or he says he lost, lost the fight, and he's going back to training, and he's going to keep at it. That's all a professional can do, right? Like, you can't win every fight, so the only thing you can control is your attitude when you lose. Yeah, uh, the three Montreal guys were in pretty good spirits, honestly. Uh, I was a little worried for Tyler Wilson for a little while because he wasn't saying much. But then I, I kind of, by talking to him, figured out that I think that that's just the way he is. He's not a guy who mm -hmm. talks uh, all the time. And when you got like uh, uh, Louis Sanudakis there and Cedric Lachal, like, there's there's plenty guys to say plenty stuff. Tyler doesn't need to be there and talking all the time. But yeah, him, uh, Victor and Maxime, they... Like they both, they, they all lost, but they all they all can see how they lost and what they should work on. And for Max, I I used to have this conversation with him because he always say I like I really want to go to the UFC, but I wish that I can have at least ten pro fights before I get there. And I I used to say I feel you, man, but if the UFC calls you, like if you win your next fight and you're the champion, if the UFC calls you and you're seven and one, you can't tell him no you can say oh no uh, i want to wait because the, the opportunity the opportunity might never come again mm -hmm. and i think that this fight yes it's a loss it's not a bad loss because he, he lost to a very good opponent and kind of pushes back the, the ufc hopes for now which probably leads him to having at least 10 pro fights before he gets there. Yeah. So maybe the plan is working all along. Of course, you don't want to go there and lose fights. That it's not the way to get to the UFC. But I think it was maybe going a little faster than Max would have hoped it went. So I think this kind of slowed everything down. And he, he might be um, able to, 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 to do what he wanted to do all along. Uh, in the end, and yeah, like he, he's in good spirits. Like he got control. He knows what happened. He knows what he needs to work on. It's like it's not like it's a super close fight where you're let there at the end. And like, what have I done wrong? Why did mm -hmm. I lose this fight? Mm -hmm. Got dominated four or five rounds on the ground. There's he, like there's no yep. ambiguity there. He knows what he needs to work on, and he's gonna work on that, and he, he's gonna be back. Well, we'll be here to watch him when that happens. And you brought up a good point about being ready for the UFC. And I know I, I had a friend who used to fight in the UFC. His name was Ryan Jimmo. And he always told me Listen, before he got in the UFC. An amazing guy. Thanks. Man. Yeah, he was, a, he was special, that's for sure. Um, he used to mention to me before he got in the UFC that he didn't want to go to the UFC and, and be just a guy who had a certain skill set and lost his first couple of fights because there's killers in the UFC. He wanted to get to a spot where he knew he was ready, and that's what happened. He was finally, eventually able to get in the UFC, and he did well. In fact, his USA debut, he won the record for the fastest ever KO uh, in UFC history, a uh, seven seconds against, uh, what's that Australian guy's name? It'll come to me. Uh, I, I, I used to like him a lot, that Australian guy, too. Uh, I'll find it for you. Uh, Elvis Sinosek. No, not Elvis Sinosek. No, Was no, it Elvis? no, no, that's his. No, no. Oh, he, it, He's like oh the Apopotamus or something like that. He, he had a funny nickname. He submitted I can't believe guys. He... Yeah, I'm having a brain fart. Anyway, Jemmo used to say that he didn't want to go to the UFC and, and not be ready. So... Perosh, Anthony Perosh. Anthony Perosh, yeah. 
Yeah. Just before I took that apology, I just remembered the Anthony Peroche. Yeah. Okay. Good call. Like. Thanks, man, for saving me. Um, but yeah, it makes me wonder. I don't know. Are there any fighters out there who have delayed their entry into the UFC because uh, they knew they weren't ready? Uh, if if you know anybody watching, maybe post a comment down below and just let us know what you think. It'd be kind of cool to know. I think it's smart. Like I, I wonder. It's probably the smart thing to do. But you're right. I you know if they don't take it, what if they lose their next fight or two? Do they lose the opportunity forever? Um, maybe it's not a, I know a lot of guys want to get to the UFC, but I don't know. Do you want to get there and, and you know, go Owen three? Maybe not. I don't know. I'm not sure. Yeah, I think back then it was maybe a little easier to, to do that. Nowadays, the roster is so like right now, the roster yeah. is full and they need to cut guys to make place for yeah. other guys. And almost all of the guys that they sign, either they sign them from the contender series or there are guys that fought on the contender series that didn't get signed but got another fight one and then they get signed so they're kind of building a, a path towards the ufc that everybody kind of has to go through so if they come calling i i think you you better just say yes and hope that you're ready and like we've seen some great ufc fighters i, I have weird beginning to their ufc careers but they they're they able to to stick around and and make it work in the end and become contenders so yes it's tough to, to 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 grow as a fighter in the big leagues but like if that's what you gotta do i think it's better that than saying no and then something tragic happens and you just never get there yeah good point fair point Okay, let's talk about uh, my Fight of the Night Awards, or my, my uh, event awards. And let me see if you agree with me, but you didn't said you didn't watch all the fights. So I gave... I rewatched uh, everything on Fight Pass after, though, so I... Okay. I, I've, I did that just for you, Andy. <laughs> Thanks, man. Appreciate it. I wanted to come so, ready, the MMA <laughs> show. Come on. Come on. All right, so I gave two Fights of the Night. I gave one to the main card and one to the undercard. The main card, I gave Ali Wasuk, defeated Tyler Wilson, submission, rear naked choke in the third round. Uh, you mentioned Tyler was in, in OK Spirits again as well. That was a really close fight, man. They both looked good. They both had their moments right off the bat. Tyler like caught one of Ali's kicks and dropped him to the mat right off to start the fight. So it was competitive, and Ali ended up winning the fight. And I think it's uh, I, I think when I take a look at giving a, a fight of the night award, there were other really good fights, like one, another uh, uh, one guy that came out with you is Maxime Bordage against Mitch Trezella. That was my contender, my other contender for the for the fight of the night. But when I look at something like that, I sort of have to look at the position of the fight as well and, and the gravitas of it. So um, uh, Ali and Tyler fighting for a championship, that just added an extra level to it. And that's why I sort of went their way with fight of the night. It was a great fight, strategic fight, but great fight, like good exchanges. Uh, the, you could see that both guys are, are skilled and like you got to be happy for Ali Wazouk. He just never says no to the toughest fight. He's always mm -hmm. there on every BFL event in a prominent spot fighting against a great opponent. And I think from the get go, the, the, the guy was kind of seen as a future BFL champion and everything. And. He, he had his losses against Siri, but he finally he, he got his hands on gold. And but I'd, I'd give it up to Strazella and Bordage if I had the choice. But honestly, if I, I, I had to give a fight of the night for, like, let's say the, the old card, the, all the pro fights, uh, prelim or main card, basically I'd cheat. And I'd give fight of the night to either Martin Guzman or Gil Moctezuma, and I'd give the other one the knockout of the night. That's what I'd do. Okay. I know well, it's one round fights or one minute fights, but how crazy yeah. were these one minute fights? Yeah, there's some good knockouts. I gave knockout of the night to Jaden Martin. He uh, defeated Luis Guzman with a, with a knockout 31 seconds into the fight. And I don't know if you did you did you see that live or did you watch it in the replay? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I was watching with uh, Isaiah Miritok, and it was it was crazy, man. Because when I heard that on Fight Pass, man, that sounded like a sledgehammer hitting a piece of concrete. Holy moly, that was hard. Uh, yeah, and Jaden was hurt, like, very early in that fight. And he had to, like, for a 30-second fight, you see the result. You're like, ah, oh, this guy <laughs> destroyed the other guy. Oh, no, there was an old no. man living in packed yeah. into 30 seconds. It was yeah, for sure. insane, insane fight. <laughs> okay, uh, undercard fight of the night. I gave it to Roman Tassoni, defeated Michael Tse. It was a really good fight. It was fantastic, back and forth. Um, yeah, it was good, really good fight. I don't know if you got a chance to see that one. Unfortunately, I didn't. 
It was a it was a knockout punch in the second round as well for Roman Tassoni. And uh, BFL said yesterday on their Instagram that Roman's going to go professional now, so his next fight should be as a pro. That's good for me. Okay, uh, submission of the night. Now, this is where people uh, disagree with me, but I gave submission of the night to Rodrigo Cezanando, defeated Scotty Stockman with a rear naked choke at 304 of round one. Uh, uh, Rodrigo looked really good. He was in backpack for quite a while on Scotty for at least a couple of minutes. Was really smart with it. He wasn't tiring out his legs. He put them in good position and he was able to get the choke. And it just, uh, it was like he went in there and, uh, you know, quick night at the office for him. No, good performance. Uh, I I had my worries about uh, St- Scotty Stockman uh, because of his record. Honestly, his record was good, but if you take a look, a closer look at his record, he like he did not face good competition. Mm-hmm. Like eighteen and fifty two, fourteen and thirty six, mm-hmm. uh, twenty two and twenty five. So I I was wondering is the guy just like basically a can crusher he, and he's gonna get destroyed by uh, by Rodrigo, but he looked like a decent fighter. He looked like he, he had something to to, to give, but uh, Cezanando is ve- is very good man. He's super impressive generally and uh, I totally enjoyed his performance. Uh, I'd have to give this a mission of the night to to, to I, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be a sellout once again. But uh, come on man, Powell River Jiu Jitsu. That's where you need to be if you want to learn the, the, the craziest. If you want to be a Canadian Diaz brother, you got to be a well-led brother, man. I, I love these two guys so much. And the, the way that Nick had to follow through with the guillotine, get the sweep, switch for the grip because the guy wasn't tapping from the arm in guillotine. So he had to, to, to get his hand all the way through and adjust to the like power modif- modified power guillotine like without the without the arm it, it was a, it was good it was a, a nice submission so that would have been my pick honestly but uh, that was a good very, one yeah good candidates i think uh, on this card play, plenty of guys could have won the submission of the night okay i didn't give an award for an oh my god award of the night but my oh my god moment at the event was when navid zangane got rocked at the start of his fight and he went into zombie mode and he just like his body stiffened up and he was holding on to the opponent and he just wasn't moving. I thought he was maybe dead for a second, just tongue in cheek, not really. Uh, but he came back recovered and he won his fight. And I was just incredulous the whole time. That was absolutely incredible. Did you get a chance to see that one? Yeah, I had the chance to see that one. And like, I don't want to be here and like do a, a, an awful generalization of like, oh, these people do these things, but. We've got our own uh, Iranian wrestlers uh, that fight for samurai, like Mehdi mm-hmm. Zaidvan, and, he, and we've had the Javan Majoub, who's a, a judoka, mm-hmm. but who's an Iranian. Uh, Mustafa Salizadeh, too, another heavyweight, who's a, an Iranian wrestler, and these these people are insane, man. They're insane. They fear nothing. They're not programmed to, 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 to fear anything. They're not programmed to lay down for anything. So to see Navid get dropped like that and just wake wake back up basically like nothing <laughs> happened because i think he, he yeah. got knocked out man but he, he probably think so woke too. up when he hit the floor and then like he got beat up a bit but then still got the reversal and started beating on the other guy almost instantly so now nah, th- th- this guy's a zombie he's super impressive but like i said i don't want to say like iranians are insane and they're 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 impossible to kill but all the Iranian fighters are no, I know are insane and are impossible to kill and are yeah. super skilled at, at wrestling and grappling generally and super athletic and like they just got the mindset too. So I think Navid has everything to become like a, an elite MMA fighter, honestly. If he has, mm-hmm. And he's got the good training too. He's got a big team behind him. So uh, you love to see this, honestly. And you would think that anybody who's going to sign up to fight him next time is going to watch that and they're going to think, oh my God, maybe I shouldn't be fighting this guy. Because if, if you want to beat him, it's not going to be easy and you, ha- you, have, to, you have to beat him because he's not going to give up ever. Uh, just look at the Xavier Nash fight. Like how tough was that yeah. for both? Yeah. And Xavier pulled it through. But like Xavier is like a, one of the five, six best lightweights like that are active on the Canadian circuit. Xavier yeah. Nash is like one of the elite lightweights for sure yeah for sure okay i'm taking a look at my notes and see if there's anything uh no i think i think uh oh i guess we should have mentioned this in the ali wazook fight but after the event uh after the fight was over 
I think uh, Darcy McBride was speaking with him and asked uh, a question, you know, who's next or what's next for you? Do you want to fight one of a, one of the next BFL contenders? And Ali said something to the effect of, no, honestly, I'm looking past them. You know, I, I'm past that now. And he said, quote, give me a big fucking name, unquote. So I think Ali has sights on a bright future. He wants to go places. And he's said he's, he's ready for, for a big name and a big opponent, big possible payday that can bring him to the big show. No, of course the, the the guy is eight and three. It's two like only. Lol, I don't want to take anything away from Kurt. Say it was a split decision in his first ever and the pro fight in MMA. Like how many elite fighters lost their pro debut? Uh, I know lots of them, so I I I don't think that's uh, something very important, honestly. But then he lost to Series City twice. He's mm -hmm. eight and three. The, the, the guy is there, man. He knows that he's there. He, he's got the, the, the record that will be uh, conducive to getting a shot at a contender series or something like that. So mm -hmm. he knows, like, he, if he's able to, to fight another big name, uh, either, like, one of the, the, the big Canadian guys in his division, but they're pretty much all fighting elsewhere, like, outside of Canada, like the, the Xavier Alois and, and guys like that. He could fight Luis Adudakis, but I, I think Luis is um, is not active enough to be on a a Ali's radar. Mm -hmm. So if BFL could bring a, like an elite guy, they're good to find some very good guys from the USA. I think uh, the, the Michael Chiesa connection uh, makes it that they're, they're, they're recruiting like in the Washington State area and the, mm -hmm. or even Oregon and Northern California and they they often bring some good talents from the states so uh, I'd find a guy from the states with a with a good record and that fought good competition to to, to get the, to fight Ali and that that could probably be Ali's uh, last fight here uh, in my opinion very well could be very well could be and you mentioned that Ali had lost twice to Surrey City. For anybody watching who doesn't know, Surrey City is one of the best in Canada, and he just had his UFC debut on January 20th in Toronto at UFC 297. Uh, sir, he's he a stone robbed. cold. He got robbed. That's what he, happened he, there. He, he, got, got, he robbed, got robbed. Man. I think it's, it's safe to say that 98.15% of everybody who saw that fight thought that Sir he won, uh, although the, the, the one point seven five that disagreed were the judges so yeah, just go on google and google siri city versus ramon taveras mma yeah. decisions and look look at the scores pretty yeah. straightforward fight to score sir he came out on top though too in a way in that he 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 opened up a lot of eyes to who he is he got his nose broken early on the fight face covered in blood it was like a murder zone in there and he just fought through it it's like it didn't even happen to him he just went hardcore and and still fought. And I think he made a lot of fans that night. And I, I think my perspective is I'd rather lose a fight and do really well and have everybody think I'm a fucking warrior than to win a fight and just have everyone think, oh, that was a boring fight. I never want to see this guy again. No, of course. Uh, funny thing about that, Diego Lopez lost his first fight to Mavzar Efloev. Like, of course, he was going to lose to Mavzar. Everybody loses to Mavzar. But after that fight, he did so well that people wanted to see more Diego Lopez. And since then, he, he's on a tear in the UFC. And he was there in the corner of uh, Caleb Moctezuma, who defeated Gag and Gil. Mm -hmm. And man, like the Mexican, all the Mexican fighters were like waiting in line to take pictures with him. As soon as he, he left the cage, people in the crowd tried to stop him from like following his fighters to the, to the medicals. Because they wanted to take picture with him, like this guy's a, basically a superstar. It's rare that, mm -hmm. like, there's often UFC fighters at, at local events because they coach there to attend or whatever. Rarely they get the attention that Diego was getting, and the guy was in Vancouver. He's like Mexican and Brazilian, so not really close to home. And still, everybody in 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 the place wanted to take pictures with him. So yeah, yeah. often you you losing a fight the way Siri lost his fight can do more for him than winning a like a lackluster decision that nobody remembers after two weeks. Yeah. Faber, I, I have to tell you that I'm, I'm a little bit in danger with you right now because if it was up to me, we'd be here for another four hours talking about every little tangent that we, we go off on, and I can't really do that. I'd love to talk more about Diego Lopez uh, and Caleb, but we will talk about Caleb Moctezuma. I saw him fight, actually, and Diego Lopez, Lopez is with him at Prospect Fighting Championship last year. Caleb defeated Michael Imperato in a, in a good fight. It was a fair fight. And Michael Imperato is no joke. He is a, 
he is a stud and he he's going to beat the crap out of most people he fights. Caleb looked good and he looked good again at, at BFL. So, uh, you know, if they bring him back, that'd be awesome to see. It'd be nice to see that Mexican connection because a lot of times Mexican fighters are brought up to these local shows because these local shows are having a really difficult time finding opponents. You know, there's, there's a lot of shows in Canada now. There's a lot of fight events going on. So there's not enough fighters to go around in all the events in Canada. Plus you might have like teammates and you don't want teammates fighting teammates. So a lot of Mexicans are coming up and quite frankly, a lot of Mexicans are losing. Uh, Caleb is one of the few that is, is finding success up here and, and doing well. So I was happy to see it quite honestly. And uh, I hope they're able to bring him back. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Imperado's going to the contenders, man. So yep. th- that win on Moctezuma's record I- is is amazing. And he's 12 and 4 now. Clearly, he's got a team that's connected with the UFC. If he's with Diego Lopez, that means he, he trains along with like some of the greatest Mexican fighters, uh, men and women, that there is. So the guy, like, he, he he's probably got a gonna get his chance one day or another but yeah if this guy can come back and keep fighting in front of us like all the moctezumas and the el videos like the elite mexican fighters that we get to see here uh, i want all of them and it's always the guy that i end the, the guys that i end up getting along the the best with i know you do yeah yeah i love the mexicans man the mexicans and the ntt guys all right well <laughs> All right, favorite. let's wrap this up. Uh, before we let you go, why don't you take a minute and just talk about the MMA talk and what's going on with you with that? Oh, man, we're, we keep uh, doing our thing, man. I don't got, like, anything special coming out. We got the iPoke podcast on every Sunday. It's in French, like, unfortunately. You guys, mm-hmm. I, I welcome you all to listen. Don't know if you're going to understand much, but uh, you, you can give it a try. That That'd be cool for sure. Uh, and yeah, man, that's about it. We're looking forward to uh, what's coming next. I think even the fight uh, is it fifty six or sixty five? I'm kind of lost with the numbers, but unified fifty six. The fight event, yeah, it's looking pretty good. Yeah. We just uh, saw the, the the full real lineup come out uh, recently, so yeah, no, we'll be looking forward to every event. C- keep uh, uh, covering the fights, man. Giving a platform to these fighters and I. I but yeah, Andy, man, I really got to give you your props, man, because I'm not always the most positive guy, honestly. And like, I just call it like I see it. And sometimes, man, I, I just don't see the good in things. But the way you're always honest, but also positive, you always find a positive spin on everything. And it's just refreshing because there's lots of negativity in the world of MMA, in my opinion. And to have people like you that like, man, your passion just shows you like that that stuff so much. You, you give so much of your time to cover these events, to attend these events, to talk to the fighters, give them a platform. And like your work, your work is greatly appreciated, man. We need people like you. You've always been like your OG of the, of this stuff, man. But the way that, that you're back now and mm, like more present than ever, almost it's amazing, man, for, for, for everybody in the MMA community, really, man, you're, you're a big part of it all. And, that's why I'm I'm always so happy to come on your show, man. I feel like we all need to to push this stuff up together, and mm-hmm. like you're you're one of the main uh, characters for sure, man. Well, Fabra, it's it's uh you're really kind. I appreciate you saying those words. I think maybe we can be like like BFL Unified and Samurai. And we can share and we can go on other people's shows and prop each other up and and help grow this thing. So, uh, that's my thoughts on that. All right, Faber, thanks for your time. Appreciate my man and fans. I highly encourage you to check out Faber Glass on YouTube and other social media platforms. The MMA Talk, the iPoke Podcast, all great things. Make sure you log in and check them out. Well, that was fun. You got to say that Faber is quite the character and I love him. So awesome. Thanks again, Faber. We are now joined by the new BFL featherweight champion, Radley Da Silva. Radley, welcome to the MMA show and congratulations. Thanks so much, and thanks for having me again. Oh, it's my, it's my pleasure, man. So you're just a few days removed now from your victory. How are you feeling right now? Tell us your thoughts. I'm um, feeling good. The the body's feeling good. Obviously, after a long training camp and even a 25-minute fight, little bumps and bruises here, but luckily I was able to take uh, no punches to the face, so still looking good. My daughter's not scared to look at me, so I'm happy. <laughs> That's good to know. Tell us your thoughts on, on the fight. How'd it go with uh, former interim champion, Maxime Susi? 
I mean, it literally played out to the T exactly how I imagined it, even down to the last moment of the fight. Um, I knew that he would be dangerous even to the last second. So I was taking it seriously. But at the same time, I just knew exactly what I was going to do in there, man. Like I said, I was going to break him. I was going to make him extremely tired. And by the fourth and fifth rounds, where I was going to feel the most uh, comfortable. And uh, it was, it was, that's exactly right. A lot of people forget I just don't have much cage time in there. You know, I, I know I have uh, some good wins and now I'm the champ, but, uh, and I've been training forever. But at the same time, uh, being in the cage is like, it's a different, uh, it's a different thing to be comfortable with. So I feel like every time I get in there, I'm just, I'm just happy to be able to get the time in there and uh, grow in the cage as well. So I'm, I'm overall ha happy mm -hmm. with the performance. Like I said, the Mac Bloom performance, I was really frustrated with myself. I didn't get to finish with this one. I'm not, I'm not too frustrated. And I feel like it'll help me be able to, to grow and work on the things I need to without being so cluttered mind of uh, too emotional. So I feel like yeah. I'm happy with the performance. 50, 45, basically across the board, what, one judge gave him one round, but I mean, it, I, I don't count that as a loss if just one judge mm -hmm. gave him one round. So 50, 45 across the board, complete domination, didn't take one single punch. Um, he maybe had 30 seconds of success. So in a 25 minute fight, took walk out unscathed and completely dominating. It's like that. What else, what else more can you want other than a finish? So <clears throat> what you said about the cage time is accurate. And I've heard it uh, many times before from other fighters that there's no substitute for being in a cage mm -hmm. against somebody who's trying to hurt you. I mean, training's training. It's great training. Of course you need it and you can put in all the training you want and all the years you want, but there's no substitute for, that time when the when the door closes and there's only three of you in there and one of them's a referee. Yeah, for me specifically, it's more it's more the striking, just being comfortable in the striking, just knowing that I have the eyes to get out of any any situation and the reflexes. I just to trust my reflexes, mm -hmm. my natural reactions to because I have I've been I've been striking forever too, and it's just. Uh, but it's different, like you said, to be in the cage. And by the fourth and fifth round is when I started to feel more, most comfortable and started to let more shots off on the feet. But it's like, I'm only going to get more and more comfortable and expect to see even greater, much greater performances on the feet. I talked to my teammates too, you know, guys, with like 10 plus fights. And they were even telling me they they didn't feel comfortable uh, striking until like maybe their like mm -hmm. eighth or ninth fight. It, it, takes a, it takes a while to get comfortable in there. So I feel like I'm still learning on the job and... Uh, what 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 better way can you do it other than the completely dominating a guy the way I did? So uh, I can't be too upset with my performance at the end of the day. It was a complete masterclass on, on MMA. And I know going into the fight, a lot of the talk is who is the better mixed martial artist. And I clearly proved that I can put it together at a much higher level. <laughs> uh, coming into this fight, Maxime was really well known as a striker. He has a strong karate background, good punches, good kicks. And you really nullified that whole thing and you closed the distance and you didn't give him space, which is something he needed. Was that the game plan going in? Yeah, the game plan going in was obviously, uh, I knew his best weapon, like I told you, was a kick, right? And uh, he mm -hmm. just, he, he, you could clearly see he didn't want to throw it after being taken down one time and feeling me on top. Uh, like I said, most guys, they think, oh yeah, he's just laying there on top, but it, uh, I'm telling you, <laughs> the fact that he even made it a few rounds without, <laughs> without quitting just from the top pressure is uh, good on him because when I get on top of you, man, it's a, it, I don't even have to punch you. It's a world of hurt and uncomfortability. Like you could see he was trying his hardest to stay composed and not over, uh, exert himself. But I, 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 just when I'm laying on top of you, it's very uncomfortable. I'm putting a lot of pressure on your chest and your stomach and making it really hard to breathe. So you, you can't just uh, lay there and accept it. And so you end up having to spend all this energy trying to get out of really uncomfortable positions. And that's when it's, it slowly starts taxing you. And that's what I was gonna, I already said I was going to do that to him. I was going to uh, drown him into deep water. And I feel like I, I did, I did tell everyone I have, I had a point to prove about cardio because I, <laughs> that narrative, man, was like, I don't know why I've never been slightly annoyed about something going into a fight. Um, the way I was about that whole cardio narrative, because like I can go, I can grapple one round for like an hour straight without even stopping. Like I do hour long rounds, just one round of grappling for an hour mm -hmm. and like 25 minutes is nothing. As you saw, like I wasn't even breathing hard at all at the end of it. I was, uh, yeah, I was fully aware and yeah, I just wanted to prove that I, I can grapple hard and will have no worry about cardio. So now it's going to be, it's going to be a little tricky finding fights because not many guys can do that for five rounds. Right. 
So I know guys are going to look into that and be like, can I keep up with his cardio now? So that's going to be the, the narrative going into my mm -hmm. next fight is can, can my opponent keep up with my cardio? <clears throat> I say it all the time that it takes a fight, watching a whole fight uh, for its entirety to get answers to questions about certain fighters, right? And I think after 25 minutes, there's certainly a bunch of questions about you that were answered and the cardio is a, is a big one of them. You've put that to rest now, so that's that's good, I guess. I guess uh, the next BFL is going to be May 9th, uh, BFL number 80. You said you didn't even take a punch to the face and you're feeling great. And last time we spoke, you also, also mentioned you want to really start being more active inside the cage and getting that cage experience. So is that a possibility for you to think, or is that still yet to be decided? I'm, I'm trying to find a fight before May. I'm, I'm trying to look for something for wow. maybe late March, early April. I, I, like I said, why would I, why would I hang out on the sidelines if I didn't take any damage? Uh, I'm ready to take a fight short notice 155. I, I don't, I don't need to do a, a whole eight week camp because I'm in shape at all times. You know, I took, I did a whole eight week camp this time just because it's a title fight, five rounds, you know, you don't want to leave any stone unturned, but mm -hmm. I know I can do three rounds in my sleep. Like, I literally train out every day already, so I don't need to do a whole eight week camp and, you know, arrange everything for a short notice fight. I can, I can take a short notice fight whenever. Well, that's good to hear, Radley. I'm looking forward to seeing you get back in there. And it is Sunday, and I heard your family in the background, including your six-month-old little daughter, sounded so adorable. Uh, okay. Just congratulations on everything. I'm going to let you get back to them. Thanks a lot for your time. I appreciate it. Yeah, I appreciate you having me, and uh, I'm sure we'll be talking again real soon. Adam, Primetime Posner, welcome to the MMA Show. How are you? I'm not too bad, Andy. How are you? I'm doing well, and, you know, you must be – you know, have quite a lot of humility because you said you're not too bad when reality is just a few short hours ago, you won your professional mixed martial arts debut at Battlefield Fight League 79 uh, in Vancouver in impressive fashion. So are you sure you're just doing okay? Yeah, I'm doing, I'm doing pretty well. Um, obviously it was, it was a very quick fight, so I didn't really get to do as much as I would have liked. But again, um, if that's a problem you're having, that's a good problem to have. So overall, I'm, I'm happy with the performance. Yeah, I think a lot of people were impressed with your performance. I know I, I certainly was. One person who might Thank not you. be overly impressed with your performance, and this is kind of tongue-in-cheek, so don't be worried. Who is uh, on guard BJJ? Is that your coach? Yeah, that's my BJJ2 coach, Matt Pawn. Okay, I'm going to tell you what Matt posted on Instagram. He said, <laughs> Adam put his opponent to sleep with a well-placed katagatami last night at BFL in his pro debut in under a minute. Few fighters in the city can do what this kid can do at 170 pounds, in the cage and on the floor. I'm requesting that his next opponent be at least competent on the ground because if they aren't, there really is no point in making the fight. Adam hasn't even had the chance to show a fraction of his skill set in his fights, in brackets, hasn't needed to. And it's time he gets tested. He deserves a tough and talented opponent next. Who will be able to handle this young phenom at 170? <laughs> that's uh so he's got a pretty strong opinion i mean i know you're happy you won the fight but it sounds like he's pretty dissatisfied i mean is there really a rush uh, at this point in your career to be to be finding super tough opponents or isn't it fair that you should need like a like a building up period it's i think it's fairly relative i think like the opponent that i fought last night was the appropriate fight you know he was a he was a, also a young fighter from mexico like similar mm -hmm. to me he was undefeated as an amateur so I essentially considered it as, you know, the best 19-year-old in Canada, me, versus the best 19-year-old in Mexico. We fought, and I put on an impressive uh, performance. And, yeah, no, I'm just, you know, I was happy with the fight. I got to show a bit more of my skill set, you know, just, just little sprinkles each time. So each time we're going to show a little bit more, and it's only going to be getting better from here. Uh, well, I'm glad that I'm a, a fight fan. I get to watch you get better from here. Um <laughs> You know, you know, once again, there's the humility. You, you talk about your, your burgeoning career. People just uh, seeing you right now for the first time might not realize you actually had an amateur career as well. So you went 5-0 and as an amateur, and yeah. four of those were by submission, I think, and one KO, TKO. So with your yeah. pro win last night with a, sub, with a submission, that makes six fights, six finishes, which is 100% finishing rate. You have to feel good about that too. Yeah, that feels great. I mean... Again, through if, as an amateur, I showed again very limited skill sets uh, because I believe I had four submissions, one TKO, and they were all rear naked chokes. So I was glad to be able to show a, a different method of finishing an arm triangle, showing that I'm well versed in both positions where we're facing each other versus when I get their back. And I showed that last night. I can do more than just a rear naked choke. 
Well, at this point, it's it's kind of too early to, to, to know, as a pundit, to know where you're going to go because when you analyze fighters, especially young upcoming fighters, you, you and I mentioned this recently with somebody else, that you have to be able to see this fighter answer certain questions, like how do they do against a really good striker? How do they do against a really good ground guy? How do they do in the clinch? We haven't seen a whole heck of a lot from you, but that's not your fault. I mean, you're doing what you have to do. So, yeah. I mean, do, do you think there's anywhere or anybody at your skill set that can challenge you? Yeah, I mean, I feel like as an amateur coming up, I feel like I've fought guys who on paper are good, but I just feel like I've fought the right way to beat them, and I fought the perfect way to beat them, and I feel like I executed that very well, uh, six for six so far. And as for an opponent that would, you know, who's next, I don't really know. Um, again, when they're, for an year professional under, you know, three fights, two fights, one fight, uh, pro debuting, there's not really, it's hard to know. So again, I'm fa- I'm fairly open. You know, we'll see who we get, mm-hmm. and uh, we'll go from there. Do you have a contract with BFL? I do. Yes. Uh, how many more fights to go? Uh, so I had a four fight deal, and then it was my first fight on last night. So I have nice. three more. Nice. Mm-hmm. Now I think off the top of my head, without looking, so I, I very well might be wrong. I think the next BFL event will be in April. Do you know if you'll be on that one? Uh, I heard May 9th. Oh, okay. Yeah. You're probably I heard, right I heard then, BFL so. 80 May 9th, so um, even if it was April, I would do it. Um, but May 9th for sure. And um, yeah, no, I'm, we'll see. We'll go from there. And yeah, just take it to the top. Well, uh, yeah, whatever happens, I'm sure it, it's going to be exciting and you're going to do well again. So before we get Thank going, you. I'm going to ask you a sort of funny tongue and cheek sort of question. Last night, something <laughs> on the broadcast happened that was pretty funny when you walked out to the cage for your fight and the commentators were saying, this is uh, Aso Polani, this is him fight. And the other guy saying, no, that's not Aso, that's Adam. And they were expressing <laughs> back and forth what was going So you actually walked out a fight early. What was the story there? So we were in the dressing room. And so basically like the BFL lineup, they had it formatted a bit differently than usual. Usually, because like the original plan was, or at least that I thought, the prelim started at 4.30. Mm-hmm. You have the under the pro fights undercard fighting at six and then you have the ufc fight pass at seven thirty. so usually they start like a little bit behind because you know they play the promos and whatnot yeah, yeah. so i thought it was maybe gonna start 4 40 but they actually started 4 30 so props to them um yeah so there's four amateur fights because two amateur fights got moved to the end so there are the four amateur fights and then i because i knew i was fight six because i knew there was the four amateur fights, there was ASO's fight, and then me. But then ASO actually told me in the back, he's like, you're fight five. And I'm like, oh, what? I need to get taped up and ready to go. So I'm like, I'm taped up, ready to go. And then I, t- I told the guy, I'm like, are you sure I'm fight five? Because I think I'm fight six. So they, they looked at the poster. and Because sure. like BFL posted the Instagram poster. Yeah. And then I'm like, They're, this lineup's not right. And I, I was trying to say that. And then... The director's like, yeah, we got to go. You're fight five. So then I went down, walked to the cage, and then I'm like in the inspection zone and everything. And then the um, the Vaseline the Vaseline guy um, said, this isn't your fight. And I'm like, knew it. So then I went back <laughs> up, and then now I'm like, hey, now we can take our time a little bit. And then the ASO fight happened, and then my fight happened shortly after. I wonder what the, the, the uh, ASO's opponent who was waiting in the cage was thinking when he saw you walk out. Was he looking at you and going this isn't the guy I'm supposed to be fighting. What's going on here? I can just imagine the panic. Yeah, I didn't really take it too seriously because I knew it wasn't my guy either. So, <laughs> I mean, um, I think okay, there well, was like, I knew I knew something was wrong. I knew that like, even yeah. if it was my opponent, like the, either either they switched it like right on the day or they maybe both got it wrong and they're just like, whatever. But either way, I mean, it was pretty funny that they mixed it up. So yeah, I hope you the don't mind me. The song talk- was wrong and everything. Well, Adam, I, I'm so sorry. I, I apologize for chuckling. I just found it so funny. But most importantly, were you thrown off in your fight? Did it affect you in any way whatsoever? Uh, I didn't think of anything of it. Because, I mean, again, I knew something was wrong because my walkout song wasn't right. The um, Again, I don't know if you've been to the a BFL event, but like usually they have like the Jumbotron, and then they have like a photo of the two fighters on the sides sure. of it. Yeah. And it was Aso and his opponent. So I'm like, okay, so... I'm like, this is not my fight. Either the production's wrong, the director's wrong, or I'm wrong. So I'm like, you know, I'm going into my pro debut. I'm like, I guess if, this is, if I'm fighting, then um, 
But I ultimately was right. And then I told the director, I'm like, come on now. I told you so. So, yeah, no, that was that was totally me. But, yeah, no, either way, I mean, we went out, we fought, watched the card, awesome card, awesome fights. Okay, uh, Adam, that's all I have for you, my man. I just want to congratulate you on a very impressive performance. 1-0 and yeah, o as a pro. Is there anything you'd like to say before we go? Um, yeah, just keep tuning in to my fights. If you want to see some electric finishes, you know, you're going to see new sprinkles every time. So, um be on the wa- be on the watch for that. Thanks, Adam. All right, BFL took place on a Thursday night, and the next night on the Friday night, we had Havoc FC 17 from Red Deer, Alberta. This was a combination MMA and bare knuckle fighting event, and you saw my interview with Lee Mian last week. First off, let me say one name: Keith Motherfucking Crawford. Uh, Hardcore Fighting Championship is a name that you might not remember, but back in the day, it was a fight promotion here in Canada, and Keith was the lead of that. He's also a former professional fighter. He's had MMA fight, and I think one MMA fight and some kickboxing fights. So whenever you see him, it really makes me happy, and uh, it's good to have him a part of any event. All right, Cor, we're going to start off with the amateur fights. Uh, there was one fight that didn't take place. It was announced: Tyler Stickley versus Curtis Anderson. I'm not sure why that didn't happen. First fight was Ray Lee defeated Tristan McMartin. It was a unanimous decision. Next up, we had. Alex Sundek defeated Salim Zafari with a unanimous decision, 29 to 27 times three. Uh, One notable point, Zafari was deducted a point for his mouthpiece coming out three times. I don't know if it's true, but to me, it looked like Zafari was purposefully spitting it out to try to get the ref to stop. Uh, And, you know, that's not always a guarantee. The referee has discretion when fights like this happen. So if you're a fighter and your mouthpiece comes out accidentally, oftentimes the referee will... uh, stop the fight to let you put it back in, but usually they'll wait till a break in the action. So it's, it's fair. You don't want to penalize your opponent because your mouthpiece came out. Uh, and if that did happen as a fire spinning it out, that's not cool. Uh, try not to do that again. Um, next up, we had Ahmad Abrejo defeated Matt Watson in a split decision. And finally, Sean Carroll defeated Datley with a liver kick TKO in the second round. I've never actually been, uh, uh, I guess, staggered by a liver kick but the ones who people have told me it's happened to them it's debilitating i guess it shuts everything down and you can't move so uh, hopefully i never get hit with a liver kick like that so i feel bad for dat lee but uh, it was a good win for sean all right moving on to professional mma we had Bilal nazari defeated jamie ingram elbows from the top position uh, watching the the fight chat for this, it was uh, a lot of people, as soon as Jamie came out, they said he was going to win, and I, I didn't think he was going to win or not win. I didn't know. That's why you have the fight. But I commented in the chat saying, you know, have you guys ever seen Bilal fight? Because he's no joke. He's tough. And he showed that he is a, such an excellent fighter, and he won the fight. So good job, Bilal. Next up, we had Jacob Guerrero defeated Andrew Marsden with strikes, TKO in round one, 28 seconds. It was a fast fight. And sometimes you get caught, right? So the fight was over quickly. Moving on now to professional MMA. We had Jason Douglas defeated Lee Meehan. TKO ref stoppage in round three. This was a fantastic fight. Uh, They announced it as the first ever bare knuckle fight in Canadian MMA history, or I think they said it was a sanctioned bare knuckle fight. I'm not so sure that's true. I know there was a bare knuckle fight in Lethbridge a couple years ago. I'm going to say 2021. I'm not really sure. Um... But maybe that wasn't sanctioned. I'm not entirely sure. If you know, you can leave a comment below in the notes uh, down below and just uh, uh, educate us. All right, next up, we had James Dalzell defeated Joshua Leducer, and that was over pretty quick. It was inside of a minute with round one. Leducer had a pretty nasty-looking cut on the lip, and the doctor stopped the fight. You never like to see fights end due to a, due to a cut. It's pretty crappy, to be honest, but it is what it is. Next up, we had Cal Kostiniuk, who just fought at Unified MMA, had a bare-knuckle fight against Josh Kitchen. This was also a good fight. You know, fighting can be fun when you're training and, you're, you know, you've got a, a friendly opponent, so to say. Uh, but bare-knuckle fighting, I don't know. It's, it's, uh, it's a little bit scary to me still. I don't know if that's just my attitude, if you, if you guys feel the same. But, um, you know, something about no gloves, no padding on your hands, just hitting you right in the face, because that's really how you how you can knock a guy out quickly is through a, a hit to the face. Uh, Cal looked good, defeated Josh. It was a good fight. Finally, we had Grayson Wells defeated Steve Roy, TKO, Dr. Stoppage at two minutes of round one. 
once again, another bare knuckle fight that, uh, you know, went, went how it went and Grayson got the victory. I would not want to be in the receiving end of a, of a man, a big man like Grayson, his, his strikes or uh, Steve Roy as well. Uh, there you go. Yeah, th- it was a, it was a good event. I think the next havoc is already scheduled. So if you go to the upcoming fight section at MMA, you can see when that's going to happen, and it will also be in Red Deer. Oh, one thing I I don't want to forget in fight number four, uh, Matt Watson was attempting a submission at one point, and the commentators were saying it was an Oma Plata, but to me it looked like he was setting up for a Gogo Plata. Uh, it didn't happen. But if you know Matt Watson or you are Matt Watson watching this, please let me know what your thought was. Were you going for Gogo Plata? Please tell me you were. Next up, we had Scorpion 15, which took place under the authority of the Oshwegan, Ontario, Six Nations of the Grand River Territory. Uh, this was a, a great event. It was an amateur. It was smallish. There were kickboxing fights. There were grappling fights. And there were MMA, MMA fights. And they were all really good. Main event, Fawaz Olayemi won his fight. And uh, he looked really good in a kickboxing match. Uh, some of these fighters, guys and girls, just went at it really well. And, you know, I, I, I like smaller shows like this because there's not a lot of production value. There's a little bit of chaos in there. People running around and people multitasking, multi-roles. Uh, it was a, it was a good event. I am looking forward to the next one. Our next guest is the chief operating officer of the Calgary-based Palace Athena Women's Fighting Championship, Jenica Wheeler. Jenica, how are you today? I'm well, thanks, Andy. Thank you for this opportunity to have a chat with you. It's my pleasure. I'm a, I've been a big fan of your organization right from the start. You've had two events in the past, and you've got your third one upcoming now. It's been announced, scheduled for March the 9th in Calgary. So mm-hmm. would you mind, just before we even get into the particulars of that event, just talking about yourself, who you are, how you got involved with Palace Athena? So I'm, as, as you've already said, I'm, I'm Jenica. I'm with Palace Athena Women's Fighting Championship. I feel very honored to be able to be a part of the Palace Athena. Um, we're a fairly new company. We've only had a couple of events so far. And I have uh, just come, come into the role of Chief Operating Officer within the past couple of years. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really passionate about it, to be honest with you. I feel like it's a great opportunity to support female athletes who, you know, don't have the same opportunities uh, as maybe um, the male opponents. So, you know, if we just give them a floor and allow them to have that, that platform to be able to shine, I'm, I'm, really, I'm really happy to be able to be supported. And I think it's, it's the right path forward. I saw before I uh, I spoke with you I did what any good journalist does and I did a, a search for you an internet search and I found uh, your Facebook account and it shows that we have one mutual friend Ryan the real deal Ford and you made posts oh, about yes. him back in like 2016 or something like that so mm-hmm. you've been involved somehow in or a fan of of combat sports for some time now how did you get interested in combat sports You know that's that's uh it, you're hitting it right on the mark. I've always been a fan of, of MMA and combat sports, always have been. And, you know, <clears throat> I I ran across Ryan Ford um, when he was pretty heavy in his MMA career. And I was just really happy to see um, another MMA competitor from within Canada, but in Alberta. And then, I don't know, it was just his presence. Like, he was just... I think his name is so fitting, Ryan, the real deal Ford, like what you got was what you, what you were going to get, you know? And I, I just, I just thought that that's, you know, that's someone to support, right? Like that's somebody who's behind it and is behind it because it's a passion, not just like something that they're getting into. I, I really wanted to be there to just kind of like advocate and just kind of voice, voice my opinion in regards to, you know, the ability that it's not just, you know, guys getting into a cage, it is, it's a passion. It really is a passion because it, it would have to be a passion to be able to just want to get into a cage and allow someone with their full intent is to knock you out that Mm -hmm. like someone has to, you know, get in the cage. And once that, that cage door closes, it's just you and them. Right. And that's all there is. Like it has to be a passion. So. Well, a, a mixed martial arts fight, it's a symbolic fight to the death. And so to some mm-hmm. people, they just imagine that and they, they, they can't even comprehend why somebody would voluntarily go into a cage and do that. Right, right. That's it. And that's where it, it truly does fall back to. It truly falls back to. It has to be a passion. You know, actually, interestingly, 
uh, we have Ashley Nichols and she's mm-hmm. from Ontario. She's in, she's a Canadian fighter and she's actually t- uh, fighting for our straw weight title on March oh, wow. the 9th at the new, Nutri- at the nutrient center. But it's interesting. She came out to our launch event um, over three years ago. And I remember having that conversation with her. She actually describes it not just as a passion, but as an obsession. Like she is, you know, she, she watches fights in her spare time. She's constantly catching up on it. And then on top of it, you have their training, their, their constant awareness of their nutrition. So we, we could probably say it is as a passion, but maybe it's a little bit of like, no, this is my obsession, you know? Yeah. I know Ashley very well. Actually, I'm from St. Catharines where I am right now. Uh, and so oh. she's a great, she's a great catch for you. She's fought in the States and LFA. She's got some, uh, mm-hmm. some Muay Thai world title. So what a terrific catch. Good for you on, on yes. snap, snagging her. It seems like you have yeah, a couple fighters. It seems like you have a couple fighters that have, have performed in your past events or still in this one that you, you've been attached to, like uh, like Andy and uh, mm-hmm. Melissa Croton's fought before. So what is it about a fighter that will make you want to embrace them under the Palace Athena umbrella? So I think that that's, a, that's an interesting question. I think, you know, Palace, I think we're really... I don't think that we're trying too much to eliminate or cherry pick. I really think that you know, we, our doors are open to a lot of fighters. So we actually have a match on our card this time is, is 145 featherweight. And so we are, um, we are, you know, keeping our doors open for anybody who we can match up. And, you know, we do, we do really want it to be, you know, fair matches, but we also want it to be like, a match where these guys really feel like they went in and earned that win, earned Mm -hmm. that title, you know? So I think we're really fortunate. We have a great matchmaker. Um, His name is Kieran Kettle. He runs Muay Thai World Cup, but he's also traveled and fought in 50 different countries around the world. So he's got a great network that's not just within Canada or North America. He's got a lot of contacts Mm -hmm. that can source some of these fighters who actually maybe are, you know, under that under uh, umbrella of being underrepresented where they're, they're like these little hidden gems. We have this girl, um, uh, lady, uh, uh, Claudia Ledette. She's from Brazil. She Mm -hmm. fought on Chris Cyborg's, um, uh, promotion a few years ago and she won the title. So we are so happy. She was supposed to come for our first event. There were some visa issues. It mm-hmm. didn't. It didn't go through. But we're happy to have her here. But that's that's what I mean. Is like we're lucky to have Karen Kettle, who has got such a good reach, to be able to bring in some of these fighters from all of these other areas who are underrepresented, but who honestly are going to go in there and it's going to be a banger. Yeah. <laughs> like it is. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, they're going to go in there and they're going to give it all, but it's going to be something to watch. Like that's, that's the exciting part. Like, you know, when we look at Andy Newwin's uh, first fight against Laura Fontour, I was cage side. And I just remember Laura having Andy's arm in the arm bar and Andy was just, you know, like giving it her all, but that's what it's about. You know, like these girls have this passion and the excitement and energy that comes with it is amazing, you know, but I think we're really fortunate that we have Kieran Kettle to look for all of these girls outside of just North America to bring them in. So they have that opportunity. And, you know, like anybody who's been given an opportunity who doesn't maybe have as many opportunities, they are really there to showcase their skills. When it comes to uh, women's sport in general, not just mixed martial arts, it's always a challenge Mm -hmm. finding a a fan base. So there's... Mm -hmm. Uh, and there's always that discussion about men's sports with, versus women's sports. I don't really get into an argument about it because they're, they're just different. They're the same, but they're different mm-hmm. at the same time. Mm-hmm. I think it's safe to say that that women in general do not love sport as much, watching sport as much as men love watching sport. And you see that in attendance for various organizations and stuff. So how can we as a community, because in, in mixed martial arts, it's still a pretty small community, especially in Canada, how can we support women's mixed martial arts and palace athena to help you grow as big as you want to grow or as big as big as it possibly can Mm -hmm. Hmm. interesting well you know i think 
I think, you know, building the, like a fighter series and getting people to become attached to a fighter is a really good mm-hmm. opportunity because it's, it, it, I think really what people need to start having the opportunity is to connect with the fighters, right? Mm-hmm. Like where I talk about how, when we met Ashley and she came out for our launch event, it was that opportunity for me to have that personal conversation, or we had the fighter series. Um, that was produced by our videographers last year that were amazing where, where they went and followed Melissa Croden and you got to see who she really is like authentically, right? Like it wasn't just this, like, oh, you know, we're coming out to shoot like, Hey, you know, go do your thing. We're just going to follow you. Like, I think people need to see, it's not just like, it's not just these people who are like this kind of barbaric kind of idea. Mm -hmm. Like, honestly, we, sometimes I like will be out in public. And I think to myself, wow, she's got a lot of confidence. She's got like, like her shoulders are back. I wonder if she's ever fought. You know what I mean? Like, just like that kind of, they are really the same people in the grocery store. So if we can connect that same kind of, um, no, no similarity, I think that can try to help draw in, uh, some more audience. I think you're, you're, that's a really good point. I mention often in interviews, or maybe I don't even mention it, but I think it anyway, and I do say it from time to time, is that fighters, when most people look at fighters, most fans, they see fighters during the fight event, and they think of them as a fighter. But outside Mm -hmm. of that 15 minutes, they're people, right? Like they have lives, Mm -hmm. they have families, they have hopes, they have dreams, they have aspirations. And I find that a a really good way to to draw people into them, or the sport, is to allow the, the fan to see themselves within the fighter which a mm-hmm. lot of people do, mm-hmm. right? That's why a lot of people mm-hmm. watch fights. They love, it's thrilling. Uh, well, a lot of the, most of them are thrilling. They, they imagine themselves in that position. So I think trying to get people to, uh, I'll, I'll use the word love, but maybe it's not the right word, mm-hmm. but people to, mm-hmm. to love your athletes or, or be affectionate toward your athletes is really smart. Mm-hmm. So yeah, yeah that, that's my thoughts on that. <laughs> so uh, I guess we have your third event coming up. So it's it's basically one every year and change. So is that plan? Mm-hmm. Is that the plan to be like a, a once a year kind of event, or do you hope to have more frequent events at some point? No, no, yeah, we definitely are trying to gear up to have more events. Um, so we are looking at our next card um, being all amateur. So that's one thing that Palace really wants to support is to actually give the opportunities for the the amateur fighters. You know the it. it it's very common for female fighters to move into the pro card because there's not as many amateur fights. So palace, we would really like to support the amateur fighters. So we're trying to look at trying to navigate around, um, gathering enough amateur fighters because it it is a problem because they are, you know, they're, they don't stay amateur for very long because they are kind of pushed into going pro. So Mm -hmm. with palace, we want to, we want to give them that platform, right? So we want to open the doors to the amateurs and give them an opportunity to, sh- to be showcased on pay-per-view, the same as all of the pro fighters, but it'll just be amateurs. So we're looking at trying to establish our next event, um, maybe June, maybe wow. July, we'll have to see, but we're hoping to hold our next event and it be all amateur. And then we'll look into the fall for our following date. But yeah, we are looking at trying to just hold some more just to give some athletes, just not to give just athletes, but to give everybody the viewership, that opportunity to see what we're showcasing and for the athletes to, you know, to not get that cage rust, to be able to be out there, you know, in the cage with the lights with the audience that's that's the exciting part for the athletes that's different from the training so we we do want to hold some more more events that are more regular throughout the year for sure amateur mixed martial arts is a bit of a mess in a couple places in canada it's really challenging like there's no even amateur mma in ontario where i live Mm. Uh, my daughter started training brazilian jiu-jitsu and and and, well mma basically at niagara top team a couple years ago Mm. and i think it's important for young girls at that age she was i don't remember how old she was when she started 10 or something but uh, it's important for them to be able to imagine there's some place for them to go. Like, what's the destination, right? Sure, there's yeah. their plan. They're going through a journey. They're learning how to do all this stuff. But 
trying to imagine themselves going straight to professional is pretty daunting. So to know that there might be an mm-hmm. avenue, amateur MMA mm-hmm. for, for, for women that they can aspire mm-hmm. to, that's a pretty important notion, I think. Yeah, I agree with you. I agree with you. And you know, like, I just don't think that it's the right path forward for them to not be able to have those amateur fights to build up that experience, right? Like when we talk about the difference between training in a, in the gyms to be training in or not to be actually fighting in front of the audience, with the lights and the cameras and all of that, because it's a, it's a different, it's a different vibe. It's a different essence, you know, and to be able to put on those shows and to get in there with your opponent and know like, this isn't just, you know, sparring or training. Like this is, this is really it. And to get more of those under your belt, to, to be able to have that confidence, you know, like, you know, okay, so round one is done. What do I do? How do I calculate? How did I respond? What, how can I improve into, into your next round? Everybody needs those kind of foundations to be able to build up without that foundation to just be pushed into pro is, it's not in the fighter's best, best interest. So, you know, I think it would be great, you know, for us to build that opportunity for the fighters. Well, it sounds like you're, you're heading in the right direction already. So, uh, <laughs> Palace Athena, uh, number three is happening March 9th in Calgary. Do you have any final words? Oh, first of all, I'd like to thank you very much for speaking with us. Uh, mm-hmm. this will be on the MMA show number two ever, uh, coming up this yeah. Monday. Uh, is there anything you'd like to say before we go? Well, I would like to let you guys know that we are, um, you know, we, we bring Felicia Spencer has been a true advocate and supporter for Palace Athena since day one. She'll come back as our cage side commentator and in, in cage commentator to be able to talk to our fighters after their fights. And uh, so we're very fortunate to have her support, you know, and then, you know, Chris Cyborg, she has been a true support for Palace from day one as well. Um, she'll be back with a meet and greet on the Friday before our event on March the 7th, on March the 7th, um, and uh, pardon me, March the 8th. On March the 8th at the Marriott Hotel, we'll be having a Chris Cyborg meet and greet and Felicia Spencer meet and greet. We do have a celebrity guest um, that we are really holding close and feel very, very fortunate uh, about having. I don't know if you've heard any 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 sort of conversation but the ice man is coming to Chuck the Liddell. nutrient center with palace or, athena on chuck March. Liddell or, yes. or johnny stereo no or stereo. chuck liddell okay <laughs> yeah yeah that's fantastic yeah. it's funny you may, i just yeah. saw a video of him i think yesterday of him uh, a friend or somebody asking him to leg kick him and chuck still got it man <laughs> chuck chuck w- whacked him in the leg and buddy went mm-hmm. down it was pretty funny to watch yeah okay. well you know we reached out to him and just kind of like had a little bit of conversation about like what our vision and mission is, you know, like to give the opportunity and to support the athlete. And he, he and his manager were like, you know, that's something that we can get behind. So we're really fortunate to have this kind of exclusive within Canada support from Chuck Liddell, like honestly, like a legend, a legend in the industry. Right. Of course. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, yeah. Jenica, once again, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you speaking with us. Thanks for everything. Good luck with your event. Yeah, thank you. Actually, you know, there's one thing I didn't speak about. So yeah. all of our tickets will be on sale. Uh, they're on sale now at Show Pass. So Palace Athena 3 on Show Pass. And then we are offering our pay-per-view. Uh, and it is $29.99 at millions.co. Mm-hmm. So all of that is available now. Fantastic. I'll make sure I update your page at MMA with all that information. Uh, Yeah, Jenica, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Andy. Thank you. I don't know about you, but I think it's fantastic that our female fighters in Canada and and elsewhere are getting an opportunity to showcase their skills, and Palace Athena is doing just that. Two weeks ago, both Fight League Atlantic 13 and Samurai MMA 9 lost one of their main event fighters either on the day of the weigh-ins or the day after the weigh-ins, after they were hospitalized for various reasons, uh, but both presumably due to the weight cutting process. To talk about this issue, we're going to be joined by Dr. Faisal Remen, a nephrologist from London, Ontario. Dr. Remen, thank you so much for speaking with us. Andy, thanks for having me on your podcast. Oh, it's my pleasure. And it's funny how just right off the bat, you said that calling it a podcast, I never really thought of it as a podcast, but I guess it kind of sort of is. And uh, I've had a few other people ask me about it. So I guess this is a podcast. So thank you for being here. 
Thank you so much. Okay. So, you know, people watch our, our viewers right now watch TV or they watch the internet when medical doctors come on and talk about a range of topics, oftentimes about sports, because we have a lot of sports fans on here, but there's something very unique about you, why it's important that we speak with you on this topic. Could you give a little bit of background on your, your combat training and your combat background? Sure. I mean, um, I'm a, a kidney doctor by trade. And um, back in the day when I was in my early 30s, just starting out, I, um, I had gained a tremendous amount of weight. I'd become quite obese, actually. And I bought a house that I couldn't afford. I had young children. And so I applied for life insurance and I was diagnosed uh, you know, uh, with, with diabetes, high blood pressure and high cholesterol. And that really uh, scared me because you know, um, I knew what the consequences of those conditions were if left untreated. Mm -hmm. And so I said, you know what? I need to change my lifestyle. And I uh, started eating properly and I started exercising. And for me to be involved with exercise, I needed to have a goal. And so I, I always had loved watching the martial arts and boxing and kickboxing. And so I said, you know what? Let me use those uh, modalities to try and improve my lifestyle. And so I started training in boxing initially and that really helped me get in great shape. I lost 100 pounds over six months and my blood work all normalized. And I just stayed in love with the sport and in love with combat sports. And I continued to uh, compete and, 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 and train from that time on. And certainly it was, a late, it was late for me. You know, I was already in my early 30s. And so I really wanted to kind of go on a fast paced program and, and um, compete and, and and use combat sports actually to raise money for medical research, which I was also passionate about. And so it's been a blessing. Um, I've competed in boxing, kickboxing, and mixed martial arts, and uh, Muay Thai, and uh, it has enriched my life tremendously. And you've had actual fights, haven't you? Yes, I've had 17 fights. Um, about uh, se seven of them in, in boxing. Uh, seven in kickboxing, two in MMA, and one Muay Thai fight. So I've uh, sampled a little bit of everything, but I love the competition. And uh, I love all of the combat sports, the various uh, combat sports, and it's been a, a real blessing for me. Mm -hmm. I first, be well, you're, you're an inspiration for sure for, for anybody, not even just fighters, but I first became aware of you several years ago when on Facebook, all the fighters I knew, not all the fighters, but a lot of the fighters from the London area would continually post about Dr. Remen and how you were supporting of them of their uh, preparations for their fights for for medicals and all that kind of thing. So that's how I first you entered my 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 realm of my sphere. Um, and you know, my question to you today is: We've had a couple high profile fight cancellations in the past week. Last weekend, we had two main events in two different fight organizations where the main, one of the main event fighters had to withdraw and actually go to the hospital due to very serious issues. One was a, a self-proclaimed, well, they, they announced it was, a, it was kidney failure, and the other one was a, a potential heart attack, which I don't have confirmation, so I can't say that for sure. Now, without going into particulars about those cases, can you just explain what, what weight cutting is and what the body goes through when they do it? No, thanks, Andy. That's a great Great question. I, I do want to give a little bit of a brief introduction to what you brought up, though, because the medical care of the athlete is a big issue. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, I think the reason the athletes very kindly were, were said some nice things about me is because I, I care about the athletes. And, and what I mean by that is many of our athletes, I mean, people come from all sorts of different socioeconomic backgrounds, but there's no doubt from my experience that the combat sports um, has um, um, practitioners who don't always have the most resources, mm -hmm. who don't have access to medical care like some others do, who may, many of whom don't have family doctors, and, and they don't have money. And so when they're asked to compete and they have to get a medical form completed, they go to the walk-in clinic and they're charged 100 bucks for the medical. You know, even if they have a family doctor, they're charged. 100 bucks or 50 bucks is a lot of money for mm -hmm. some people, for many of us especially in this economic climate. And so I always had a, that always left a bad taste in my mouth. And so I always wanted to help athletes because I think this is a great sport and, and our athletes need that support. So I always did medicals free of charge 
you know, uh, where I'd bring them to the hospital or, or I'd sometimes go to a gym and we'd open up a big station and we'd do 20 or 30 medicals all in one sitting, both wow. for the safety of the athlete. I've turned down people from competing too, for the safety of the athlete, but also to allow people to fulfill their dream of competing in martial arts. So that's a very, very important issue that I wanted to bring up front because not enough of us doctors do that. And I, I'm very, I feel very strongly that we need to improve access for medical care for athletes who are in combat sports. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for the weight cutting uh, part, I have given talks on the dangers of weight cutting for Boxing Ontario athletes, as well as for Kickboxing Canada athletes, because I am passionate about it. And um, the weight cutting techniques themselves are dangerous. And the consequences of the weight cutting can be very dangerous. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to knock the athletes who do it successfully. There are some athletes for who it's become a science. Were they able to navigate it in such a way that their health does not suffer? But even those athletes are taking risks. When you are dropping a large amount of weight in a short period of time, you're changing your body chemistry, your blood chemistry, to a point that you can cause severe damage. So number one is um, you can get um, electrolyte abnormalities that can cause your heart to go into a bad rhythm and cause uh, life-threatening complications. You um, can change the pressure in your brain such that you're much more prone to concussions and head injuries and intracranial bleeds. You're actually more prone to bleeds when you have uh, cut a tremendous amount of weight. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I don't think all the athletes recognize that. The same amount of trauma that you would be able to probably uh, take in, in a situation where you've not cut weight is not the same as when you, uh, when you cut weight and take that headshot. You're much more prone to bleeding in the brain and to swelling in the brain, which can cause death. Um, uh, in addition to that, uh, when you, when you uh, dehydrate yourself over a short period of time by doing sauna suits or by, by uh, uh, training excessively and restricting intake of, of salt and water, um, you can actually cause your blood pressure to go dangerously low and compromise the blood flow to your kidneys and your kidneys can shut down. Mm -hmm. And in certain circumstances, I've seen muscle breakdown happen where you get something called rhabdomyolysis, or which is breakdown of muscle. And the muscle protein that gets into the bloodstream because of that breakdown is directly toxic to your kidneys. Your kidneys shut down and you risk requiring dialysis. So these are life-threatening complications of weight cutting. And so um, I'm really against it. And uh, for that reason, and I feel that um, we need to be able to compete without allowing athletes to do that. Because um, mm -hmm. even though for many athletes it may be an advantage when they rehydrate and they feel strong, for many it's putting it's putting many lives at risk. There have been talks. I know that one FC one uh, one FC uh, in in Asia. I don't, you know, it's, I should have looked into this, but I know at one point in the past, they had talked about doing progressive weigh-ins where you were weighed in leading up to your event and you couldn't lose a certain amount of weight or a certain percent of your weight over a certain amount of time that would prevent fighters from having that drastic cutting. So like just a, 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 from my firsthand experience, I know that when you, former UFC middleweight champion, Rich Franklin, when he fought Jason McDonald, Jason the Athlete McDonald, Canadian, he lost 29 pounds overnight, or sorry, from the weigh-ins to when he fought, he weighed 29 pounds more. So that's 30 pounds that this athlete lost and gained in an extremely short amount of time. And just everything you said, it's, it's not surprising. Those are some serious consequences. But the thing about weight cutting, and for anybody who's watching who doesn't realize why fighters weight cut, it's because the, the train of thought for fighters is that if they're bigger than their opponent come fight day, they're going to have an advantage. So they're going to try to get as big as they can before the fight, lose a lot of water weight in the day leading up to the fight, weigh in, make the weight, and then regain that weight come fight time. Sometimes it works, like you said, doctor, but sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes the athletes are seriously injured. Sometimes the athletes are forced to withdraw from their fight. And sometimes there, I don't know if there have been any actual proven fatalities, but it wouldn't surprise me. But, you know, you're right. It's just not a good idea as far as I'm concerned. But the fighters are going to try to get this advantage. So what would you say to the fighter who wants to bring himself 
up in the world and win at his fights or her fights and, you know, make a name for themselves. So Andy, just like we don't allow any Joe Blow to drive a car without a license or, or do, you know, do certain things that, 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 that may be harmful to themselves or to society. It's the same thing with, with fighting. You know, when you, when you, when you apply to fight as a professional fighter, you have to apply for a license. In order to apply for that license, you have to obey the rules of the commission. So we need to take this out of the fighter's hands. This has to be done by all of the commissions in the various countries to make sure we create a sporting environment that is safe for all. Mm -hmm. And the way you really do that is by what you just said, you know, prohibiting excessive weight loss, more frequent monitoring of weight, more weight classes. You know, the UFC is thinking about having more weight classes to try and combat this problem as well. There and, are more weight like classes. The, just the sorry, sorry, to cut you off. There are more weight classes. It's just the unify or sorry, uh, UFC doesn't follow that that weight system. Right, and I think they're finally willing to explore that, like to open up. I don't, I don't mm -hmm. know the exact weight, but one sixty five or one eighty or yeah. you know, to yeah. have more weight or classes. Super lightweight, so sure. Yep. Athletes, but even having more weight classes is not enough because if I'm a, um, you know, if I weigh two hundred and twenty pounds before I'm competing. You know, psychologically, I'm going to want to get down to a light heavyweight and fight at 205. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm still going to. So I think, in addition to having more weight classes, you do need to put limits on on how much your weight is allowed to fluctuate leading up to the fight. And 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 I think we're going to need to a body of experts to get together to determine when the weigh-ins need to happen in the last month, let's say, before a competition, um, yeah. to, to to save the athletes from themselves. We cannot leave it up to the athletes. This has to come from the combat sporting authorities like the commissions to enforce these rules. And I think it'll make our sport a lot safer. Now, Andy, I'm going to need you to do some research for me just in case I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure there was a professional boxer who died in Ontario in the last three to five years. He came from a South American country where, and he came to Canada to compete. He did not know that in Canada we're one of the few a boxing commissions that does same day weigh-ins. So he comes in, he says, what do you mean same day, same day weigh-in? So he was way overweight because he thought he would be wow. weighed in the day before. So he cut weight to compete. And, um, and, and I and I think he ended up dying after competing. Uh, and again, because he's more from brain injury. So again, you are much more prone to brain injuries when you're having these wide fluctuations in weight. And this needs to stop. And I wish also that I don't know why some commissions um, allow day of weigh-ins and others just day before. I actually support day of weigh-ins because mm -hmm. I think people are less likely to then try and play those games. But we need to have kind of uniform rules that all of us in the world can follow. And there's too many different commissions, too many different rule sets. Um, mm -hmm. So hopefully that's something that we can change. I think that's a, a more likely scenario, same day weigh-ins to occur than uh, progressive weigh-ins, just for the fact that, uh, especially when you have got promotions that bring in fighters from away, from another province or another country even, you've got number one, you've got no jurisdiction over them. Um, you, they might have no access and th the cost would be prohibitive, I'd imagine, because the, the promotion would have to send an official with a with a valid scale and who knows if that scale is is measured the same as the official scale at the actual fight so you'd have to send people all around you know i'm not saying it can't be done i'm sure the ufc could do it but say unified mma as good as they are and as much much support and and things like that they have it'd be tough for them let alone a much smaller promotion so same day wins yeah i could see that as a possibility um you know, i know it, my it, it, Sorry, I was you know, it's say a solution that would be easily. It is a solution that could be easily, more easily operationalized compared to doing serial weigh-ins for a week. Let's yeah. say I agree. With you. Well, that's uh, that's good to hear. It's good to have your perspective. Okay, doctor, right. what do you say to the fighter? I know we you, you touched on this briefly, but what can we do as a community to get these people, these 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 athletes, to realize that? This is serious because as we talked about with, with your personal uh, weight loss journey and, you know, the, the, the precursor for that, you know, even though you knew it was a danger, you just didn't want to do anything about it for years. And you knew it was an issue. You knew it was a problem. 
And it finally took something for you to go have that aha moment. We go, man, I need to do this. How do we give fighters an aha moment to know that this is a serious issue for them to address? No, that's a great question, Andy. I think honestly, um, education. So, uh, uh, you know, man mandating fighters to attend education sessions on, on performance enhancing drugs and its consequences, weight cutting and its consequences, you know, unhealthy lifestyle choices. I think that's, that kind of education is important, I think, in this, in the area of combat sports. Mm -hmm. But, um, but in the end, we have to enforce rules. And, you know, the UFC, for example, has done a fairly good job with screening for performance enhancing drugs and we screening athletes. Um, they can even, you know, they, they're even being screened for using IVs, IV fluids. They can detect certain chemicals in the, in the, in the blood that will, that suggests that they're taking IV fluids. And so, um, um, I think those types of rules need to be enforced for, for um, uh, weight cutting as well, and if, and penalties need to be um, applied because unfortunately, by the time the fighter realizes the consequences, it's too late. Mm -hmm. So we can do education up front. We can try and get rid of this culture of of of, of, of weight cutting, and uh, um, try and educate our fighters. But in the end the rules have to be uh, enforced. And I think the only way to do that is at the level of, uh, of the promotions and of mm -hmm. the commissions. You mentioned performance enhancing drugs, all the physical consequences of weight cutting that we discussed, that's for like a, a non-performance enhancing drug person who's in otherwise good physical shape, presumably, presumably no underlying conditions. I know we're, we're painting everyone with a broad brush here, but once you start taking performance enhancing, sorry, once you start taking performance enhancing drugs, which are, are different and they're not all the same, but that affects your, your body in other ways too. So I would imagine that makes it even more dangerous, the weight cut. Oh, absolutely. I mean, when uh, one of the common, for example, complications of testosterone is you can develop polycythemia, which is where your red blood cells go very high in your blood. And, um, and if you take erythropoietin for that matter, that can also make your red blood cells go very high. And uh, if those are going high and you're severely volume contracting yourself or dehydrating yourself um, with your weight cutting, your blood can be, become very thick and you can get blood clots and strokes and, 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 and stuff like that. So that's just one example of the combination of performance enhancing drugs. If you're using cocaine as a stimulant, which unfortunately many athletes do, and then you're weight cutting and stressing your nervous system that way, you're much more prone to having heart attacks. Or, or, or variations in blood pressure that can be dangerous as well. Um, so absolutely, the combination of all these unhealthy habits, from performance enhancing drugs with the weight cutting is a bad combination. For sure. Well, I, I thought this was a timely conversation for us to have based on the, the recent events. Let's, let's hope that once this discussion gets put out there and people pay attention to it, listen to it, it'll have some sort of positive influence, just like you are a positive influence, Dr. Raymond, you, you've been a, a positive light in Canadian mixed martial arts and combat sports in the London area and, and expanding outward for some time now. I just want to thank you for everything you do and thank you for the taking time to speak with us. Uh, people know you already and they know that your words are wise, so hopefully they'll take what you said to heart. Andy, thank you so much for bringing this, for inviting me but also for bringing this topic to light. And uh, just for all of your listeners out there, I'm happy to come to your gyms and, and talk to your athletes about this because it's just so tragic when you see the consequences of what happens. And I've seen that time and time again. And so uh, I really, I'm so happy that you brought this topic to light and um, hopefully, you know, the powers uh, that be can, can make some changes that uh, make combat sports uh, a safer uh, pursuit for athletes who want mm -hmm. to pursue that career option. Dr. Raymond, thank you for your time. Thanks so much. There you go, fight friends. That's it for this week's episode of the MMA show. I hope you liked it. As always, please help me improve the show by commenting below and tell me what you liked, what you didn't like, and any improvements. Thank you to Eddie Fan last week for the suggestion for maybe animations or more photos or things like that. That's definitely something I'd like to work on and uh, I will be working on, but uh, this is a one man operation at this point and it's, it's, it's a learning process. That's for sure. The most important lesson I'm learning is that everything takes a lot longer and goes a lot more slowly than I want. So uh, I'll get there, but uh, just 
keep your eyes open and you'll see.